so I want to talk about uh, sulfur at Kava Igen, and I've given a little bit of a background here as well. But first of all, let me acknowledge my uh, co-workers here. This is Francis Stegen, who is a researcher here in Uppsala and a long-term research partner of mine. Then a former PhD student, Lara Blythe, she worked with me on gas in Indonesia. And then um, uh, a former professor from here, Sadun Murad, who helped with the sulfur isotope work and um, a former professor from uh, Scripps Oceanic Institute in uh, California, David Hilton, who has sadly passed away a few years ago, but uh, I will show some pictures with him in the presentation. So this is a work that's going back for quite some time. And as I said to Firman and uh, others, I am hoping to write some article about this, but uh, I feel I, uh, I should be pushing this now that uh, the interest in uh, Kava Igen is growing so much, and especially now with the geopark application, which I'm very excited about. So I will talk a little bit about Igen Caldera and Kava Igen, but thank you, Firman, you have kind of said a lot of things, so I can be very brief about that. Then I will talk a little bit about isotopes. And for those of you who are not specialists in isotopes, I will try to make it simple enough so that you get um, the basic uh, concept of it. And then we will discuss uh, the role or the potential role of the crustal rocks under Kava Igen. And then I will talk a few, um, I will say a few words about geothermal exploitation because I heard that uh, there are several companies that are interested. I was uh, asked by a company in London two years ago to see them and they were interested. But I have my doubts whether Kava Igen is a really good place for geothermal energy, but it's something we can discuss, of course. So uh, first of all, uh, just a very simple introduction. Um, it's uh, Kava Igen in East Java, of course, next to Merapi in East Java, not to be confused with Merapi in Central Java. And uh, there is a little hazard map on the right hand side uh, from the Volcanological Survey. And it shows that uh, big hazards are, of course, the area that could be affected by eruptions, but also the river systems are problematic. And this is because of lahars, but also because of acid overflow from the Ijen Lake. And as we have learned from Firman, this is a huge problem also further down the drainage system. But I think I should also mention that um, Kava Ijen is not the only site important there. Ijen Caldera is a coffee plantation. And as you probably see on this map, Scandinavia has the highest coffee consumption in the world. So it's very important for us that there is a lot of coffee grown in Ijen, and here's a few impressions. And much of the coffee grown in Ijen probably comes to Scandinavia, and I'm probably drinking some of it right now. So uh, this is a coffee plant for my students who haven't seen that. And there's some coffee beans that are freshly harvested. And then these need to be roasted. And that gives the concept of, or this gives the ground material for the coffee that we then uh, kind of uh, put into coffee machines or into filter coffee setups. And this is what uh, we drink in Scandinavia a lot. So, but um, let's talk a little bit about geology. Um, the Igen volcanic complex is in East Java and it hosts the hydrothermally active Kava Igen volcanic system. There is a big sedimentary succession underneath Igen and it comprises an extensive carbonate platform as Firman has outlined earlier today. And um, this is uh, very important, I believe, because uh, there is a lot of limestone beneath the system and also some siliciclastic sediments. And uh, the whole Igen caldera and also the Kava Igen system, the magmas have to pass through this, which I think is very hard to imagine as non-interactive. So I think some interaction is unavoidable between magma and the crustal rocks here. There is the older caldera, of course, and in the literature, it says there were several major episodes. I'm not entirely sure about these numbers, but this is what I found in the internet. And there was uh, several episodes, maybe uh, over 20,000 years ago and over 50,000 years ago. But at the moment, the Kava Igen crater is the main activity center in the complex. And this is where 
the uh, geothermal uh, activity is happening. And this is why it is also a possible target for geothermal energy exploitation. So the Igen uh, stratovolcano, which hosts the lake, is uh, one of the younger edifices on the Caldera Rim. And it's uh, probably best known for the prolific sulfur producing fumaroles. And once they have a lot of sulfur, as Firman said, they are called sulfatara. And uh, they are also actively mined at the present day. The volcano, the uh, stratovolcano is 2,600 meters tall and it contains um, a lake at about 2,300 meters of altitude. The lake is about one kilometer in diameter and it's estimated to have a depth of about 200 meters. The lake pH is about uh, 0 0.5, sometimes it's a little more, sometimes it's a little less, but it's very acidic, 0 0.5 pH. And um, temperature varies from 25 to 40 degrees. And it's, to my knowledge, the largest natural acid lake in the world. There has been several disasters. There was um, uh, several um, miners that died in the 1970s and also in the late 1980s. And this usually happens in combination with uh, um, acid, uh, sorry, with gas explosion. And um, there has been, to my knowledge, one fatality as uh, recent as May 2020 when uh, a miner fell into the lake, but maybe I want to know a little bit more about that event because I only read about this on the internet. So there is these outbursts of gas, which uh, on the one side for volcanologists are very spectacular, but they are of course a little dangerous. And I'll come back to that a little later. So here's some uh, information from the literature from various um, articles out there, uh, some impressions, but uh, I think we covered some of this material already. Um, Kava Ijen is the red area in the little map in the lower right, and there are several other larger volcanoes on the Caldera Rim, and then there's of course the pre-Caldera Rim, which is exposed in the north, which is also quite spectacular in its own right, but I want to focus on Kava Ijen today, and uh, here's a few older images. One goes back to the uh, 1830s, I think, the one on the left. But then also there is um, several other images here from Cadron et al. And uh, the oldest here is actually from 1805. So the lake has been described in writing first in the 17th century. So the lake is at least as we know it active for many hundred years. So this is not a young feature. It has been there for quite some time. And um, this is um, very of uh, early kind of interpretations going back to uh, Van Bergen et al. And uh, here we have um, the Cradle Lake and there's the higher edifice of Merapi behind it. And the uh, image to the right is from the internet from some hiking tour. And um, here we have several components coming together. We have a deep magmatic system, which is given in Van Bergen as well as in the hiking guide here to the right. And uh, there's gas rising up from that, but there's also rainfall that plays a role. And there's interaction between the hydrothermal system and the rock uh, formations in the area. And leaching of material from the rock is, seems to be important according to some of the research I read. And uh, it's this rather unique combination of processes that allows this lake to become so acidic. And there seems to be a steady recharge of gas from underneath that gives rise to the big sulfatara type fumaroles. And uh, this is also the reason why we have this huge sulfur deposition there. So here's some of the kind of younger models and Fearman has shown already some of these. So uh, they are all very similar. These go back to um, workers uh, that are a little younger than, um, um, uh, the one I've shown a minute ago, but uh, the concept is very, very similar. We have a magmatic system underneath, and these here by, our, by several workers, Gunnar Van et al, Van Hinsberg et al. And uh, here we have a um, magma source that interacts with groundwater, and it gives a geothermal system that feeds the lake, and the lake is steadily replenished, and it also evaporates and uh, new gas is recharged and rainwater now in the 
rainy season in particular is also recharging. So we have a bit of what I think to be a cooking pot of materials that are coming together with different ingredients being added at different times. And therefore there's a bit of variation in there. And uh, this I think um, is a complex interplay of different processes that gives rise to the lake and its specific chemistry. Now, here's a few impression, and um, I think the virtual tour from Firman has been fantastic, but uh, I didn't quite uh, know uh, the, how much you're going to show. So I added a lot of my own photos, so I'll quickly go through them with you. But here's the Crater Lake, and um, you see that there's various impressions. It's kind of got a turquoise color. It's very distinct in color. It looks very inviting, but as we all know, it's acidic, so you should not even touch the water without protection. And um, this is um, a view from uh, the uh, uh, fumarole vents coming towards you, from the gas coming towards you when you're on the crater rim. And then really it's very unpleasant to breathe in, so uh, protection like gas masks is very important. And this is when um, there is a less of it, uh, less of the kind of gas coming towards you, then you can see the Crater Lake a little better. And uh, this is uh, where my wife, when I took her up there many years ago, said, oh, that's enough, I don't want to go any further. So she decided to stay on the Crater Rim quite wisely, to be honest, because when I went down there, I had some breathing problems, as I said earlier. So this is uh, the inside of the crater wall, which is several hundred meters tall. And uh, it's very chaotic, actually. And uh, you see this yellow coating, which is all sulfurous precipitates. And uh, then once you reach the lower part of the crater, then this is the lake shore. And this is where some of the mining takes place, of course. But you see a lot of this very thin yellow coating, which is sulfur type mineralization that comes from gas precipitation. So here you have some uh, impressions of the lake, very inviting, as I said, but actually very dangerous. And um, here's a few more. The lake is highly acidic, as I said. It's, to my knowledge, the largest natural acid lake in the world. And it can be several tens of degrees warm. And while it is, or it was calm each time I was there, gas explosions are known to occur. So here is uh, one of the kind of uh, beautiful views with the different contrasting colors, the turquoise and the yellows. And you see this little kind of area in the distance, which is one of the lowest parts of the rim of the lake. And this is actually one of the main outflow routes um, feeding the acid river that drains into the Ijen caldera. And uh, here you kind of can go up there. There's a little ladder and I couldn't resist of climbing up there and uh, having a beautiful view onto the lake. But uh, the important thing here is that many of the sulfatara are channeled into pipes. And this is where a lot of the gas is condensing and it's forming these lava rivers or little um, sulfur lava flows as I would call them. So I wanna give you a few impressions of that. Here's one of those pipes that uh, has a condensed sulfur liquid coming out and it's dripping out. And this is, of course, what's economically of interest. And uh, here, several of those uh, rather makeshift arrangements to have condensing vapor that will then allow uh, little sulfurous lava flows to form. And that forms high concentrations of sulfur, which is then broken and mined. And uh, here you have some close-ups of that. Here's a little river of liquid sulfur. And it's bright orange when it's liquid and it goes uh, yellow. And you can actually watch that within minutes when it cools to go from bright orange to yellow. It's quite fascinating actually. So, and here's just a few more impressions of the pipes and these pipes get completely encrusted with time and uh, they might even clock up at some time and then new pipes have to be put in place. So there's quite some human interference with this system in order to concentrate the production of sulfur, which I think is good for the miners, but of course it's not always good for those people who like nature. So here's one of those um, uh, end points of one of the pipes with uh, an old drum used uh, to actually condense the vapor. And then you have lava 
uh, sulfur lava, if you will, flowing out there, liquid sulfur flows. And here's another one. Here's a pile of liquid sulfur, and you can really see how it's mounting up. And this is what's then later broken to be carried out of the caldera and sold as native sulfur. So here's one of my colleagues looking at uh, uh, one of the systems, and this is our gas pipe system. So we have these uh, temperature resistant uh, silicon tubes, and this is with which we sampled gas at the time. And this is some of the data I will present later. So here's a few more impressions, and um, I think it looks just outstandingly beautiful. So uh, this is why I couldn't resist to uh, put a few more pictures in there. And here's a close up of that. And there is a little uh, kind of uh, sulfur, liquid sulfur lake. It's of course very small and liquid sulfur lava flows, but uh, of course they're very tiny. So here is more impressions of the gas sampling. And later on, I understood that gas masks are really helpful when you go close down. So, and uh, these days I always bring a gas mask and I equip my team with it at the time as well. And uh, this is us sampling some of the gas. So, and of course I should mention the blue fire and um, this is um, a standard phenomenon when um, sulfur is burning. And uh, when sulfur is very hot, it emits a blue light. And this is, of course, very spectacular at night. And this is from Wikipedia. And I did a little experiment um, for um, um, a little kids project I do. Um, and uh, I have it on YouTube if you're interested. When you burn sulfur, it emits this blue flame. And this is what I think uh, we're seeing here. This is the main source of the blue light, to my mind. But um, I am curious to learn more about that when we discuss things later. So this is uh, some of the miners. Um, this is more than 10 years ago when I was there and uh, they are breaking the sulfur and uh, they're loading it up into these kind of uh, uh, baskets. And this is how they're carried out of the, um, out of the crater. And uh, then um, they are then uh, weighed and sold. And here's a few more impressions. I mean, they're quite heavy, these things, between 70 and 90 kilos, I'm told. And um, maybe some people will wonder, what do you do with sulfur? Well, I mean, uh, prior to sulfur being a byproduct of oil refinement, sulfur was the main uh, source of making gunpowder. And uh, these days, we still use it for uh, um, uh, disinfection. And uh, there, we also use it for making matches and things like that. So um, this, of course, uh, is therefore very important. And I should say that uh, once we are reducing our dependency on fossil fuels, we will still need sulfur. And it may well be that sulfur mining in volcanoes will see a revival in the next decades, because if we are get less sulfur from fossil fuel production, we might need to go back to volcanoes. So here's a few specimens of sulfur that we collected and there's different kind of textures and the uh, miners sometimes have these little toy forms, um, these molds and uh, here I kind of got a little uh, turtle and uh, they're quite uh, uh, entertaining but I think what is very important is the backside of the turtle here in the lower image because you see all the rays, the, all the crystals here. So I still use it for teaching to show uh, in situ crystallization and quench crystallization to my students. And uh, so while the turtle is of course very amusing, it's actually the crystals that you see that have solidified from the liquid sulfur that I'm particularly interested in here. So um, the fumarole activity is estimated to discharge about four tons of sulfur gas every day and up to 15 tons of sulfur are actually mined. Sorry, there's a typo there. It's not mined, it should be mined, uh, as mined daily. And uh, there's up to 200 miners at work, I understand. And uh, it's estimated that uh, this removes about 40 to up to 40% of the sulfur that's actually deposited there. So it's a renewable resource, but um, the mining takes a large amount of it away. And um, here's just a few more impressions of how this is done. Here's miners that break the sulfur. And uh, there is more sulfur being produced than is mined, to my understanding, at least in the current rate from uh, a few years ago. But uh, 
I, uh, I'm kind of skeptical about uh, whether a geopark would want to see mining in the future. But again, this is a discussion point for our session later, I think. So now quickly into isotopes. This is the work I have been doing. So uh, when we think about subduction zones, as Firman outlined, there are several sources of gas. We can have the downgoing slap in the subduction zone that will have some volatile elements. We will have the mantle wedge, which is given here in orange, and we have the upper crust. And if the upper crust is complicated, it can liberate a lot of volatiles too. And often it's a challenge to distinguish between the origin of the gas in detail. So this is why I've put a big question mark there. What is it we actually are mixing and how much is the crust contributing? I wasn't entirely sure, but let's look at what the data suggests. So let me start with this quote. It goes back to a paper in geothermics by Stimak et al. Given that this tectonic framework, the prevalence of commercial geothermal systems in Western Java may be related to the presence of older and thicker crust and the large supply of terrigenous sediments, clastic material to the subduction zone. So here, uh, Stimac speculates that there's two main influences, what is going into the subduction zone and the crust that's lying above it. But of course, this was for um, the uh, systems in West Java, but of course it applies to East Java as well. And the problem remains, if it's the subduction zone, then the subduction is very different in East Java to West Java, then why is such a prolific site as Kava Ijen uh, not affected? So I don't think that the downgoing material is the entire problem or is the full answer to the problem. So I think the cross makes quite a difference here as well. So the challenge here is uh, looking at these two isotope systems. And for those who are not familiar with isotope systems, you can look at this a little bit like a map in simple terms. There's different areas that are marked by certain geochemical reservoirs, by certain domains. And when samples fall in between them, they likely are mixtures of these domains. So here we have uh, MORP. MORP is a uh, standard mantle. And then we have Indian sediments, Indian ocean sediments. That's what's being subducted. But we also have Java jaws. And um, this is data from Merapi in central uh, Java. And the Merapi samples fall right in the middle. So here, it's not quite clear where the influence of uh, the carbonates come from, is where it happens. What is clear, however, is that crustal volatiles do play a role at some volcanoes in Java. Now, here the simple kind of um, relationship that uh, you can imagine is that if we have carbonate and we have silica magma and you mix them, then you convert the carbonate to velastonite and you release gas, CO2 in specific. And this could potentially cause a lot of crustal volatiles to be liberated under active volcanoes in uh, Java. And uh, this is consistent with some of the bubbly textures that we see in the eruptive products, but also in some of the xenolith. That means foreign rocks that are brought up by the lava. And this could add to the pressure inside these systems and could potentially lead to explosions inside some of the volcanoes. So how does this work in detail? Well, first of all, let's go a step back. I'd like to take you to um, this little study now that I'm hoping to write up in the next few months. And uh, here I'm comparing a West Java volcano, Papandayan with Kava Ijen in East Java. And if the subduction system is the main responsible factor, then we should see a very systematic difference between them because there is a small change in sediment thickness. Actually less sediment is subducted in East Java than under West Java. So we should actually see a reduction of sedimentary influence towards the East if the subduction zone is the only responsible process. And uh, very little subduction of sediment happens in East, under East Java. And this is known from geophysics as well as from geochemistry and from drill samples from out in the ocean. So this should actually be the case 
should the subduction system be the main problem? And we can test this hypothesis with the gas chemistry, therefore. So here's Papandayan for those of you who have been there. This is a nice reminder for those of you who have not been there. There was um, a big crater, it's called the Golden Crater because of all the sulfur. And there we have large fumarole fields and uh, the temperature is also very high. You see the thermometer there with over 200 degree. There's not as much liquid sulfur, but there's a few droplets and you can see that in the lower right. And I threw a coin into the fumarole as a scale, uh, but of course the coin was lost. So I couldn't get it back. But uh, here's um, David Hilton and uh, another colleague of mine, Lothar Schwarzkopf, and they are sampling gas at one of the Papandayan fumaroles. And uh, here's our titanium rod that doesn't melt when we put it into the fumaroles and it allows us to channel gas into our sampling device. And here now for this study, we also sampled at Kawai Jen, of course, and this was my second trip where I was smart enough to bring gas masks. And um, here we are sampling um, the um, fumarole, uh, the sulfatara, and we're pumping it through this little container and the gas is then collected in a um, little glass container. And here we also looked at some uh, sulfur, the, 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 the solid material, the solid sulfur and some gas for CO2. And that's the two main data sets for sulfur isotopes and for carbon isotopes, which in combination will hopefully tell us a little more. So we combine these data from the sulfur that we sampled, the sulfur isotopes with carbon isotope analysis from the associated fumarole gas. And this gives us a first order approximation of sulfur and carbon isotope system or systematics at these two sites. So we can test for the source versus the crustal influence. That's the main goal. So now here's some results. And um, here is a bar chart. And this is delta 34 sulfur isotopes. And the mantle is known to be in that green vertical bar. So this is our reference field. And uh, this, for those not familiar with you, you can take it as uh, the major landmark, if you will, purely mantle derived sulfur plots in that green bar. <clears throat> Arc lavas, subduction zone lavas from other places like Japan, the Marianas, they plot in that pink array there. And Sunda arc lavas, not fumarol gas, but lavas, they fall mainly into the dark pink array. And there's one outlier that goes a bit lower, but uh, most of them fall into the mantle array or above. Our Papandayan samples from West Java they fall also into the mantle array and the Kava Ejen lavas, they fall differently. This is quite important. They're actually quite distinct from most of the other uh, Sunda arc uh, samples that we know, the lava samples, and they're different from the Papandayan sulfur. So they are plotting towards more negative values and they don't go to these higher values recorded in the Sunda arc lavas that go towards plus 10, plus 20, they actually go into the negative range. So this is quite important. They have values of um, lower than minus five, and this is quite unusual. So, and um, the data range for Papandayan and for Ijen is very narrow in each case. We don't have huge amounts of data. It's hard to get these data, but uh, the Papandayan data, they are markedly different. The sulfur isotope values for Kavai Gen are comparatively low and they're much more negative than mantle derived sulfur and normal arc derived sulfur. As I said, if we compare this to the data, the best data out there in the literature are from De Hoekedal 2001. And this is from lavas and the lava range, the dominant lava range is plus two to plus 7.8. So this is very close to the Papandayan sulfur data, but very different from our Kawa Ijen data. So here, I think we get a very good indication that we the gas at Kawa Ijen. So just a quick comparison. This uh, concept is known from um, previous studies like in America, people have done this already in Yellowstone very early on because they have big sulfur deposits there. 
And there is a paper from the 1970s that find that uh, most of the magmatic sulfur is plus 0.7 to plus 2.6. That's the lower end of the Java lavas. But there is some sites in Yellowstone that also go to minus five, like Kava Ijen. And it was already described in the 1970s that those areas that go that negative, they are areas that are underlain by sedimentary rocks. And here these authors like uh, Schoen and Rye, they concluded that these anomalous values, they have to do with sedimentary rocks in the basement. <clears throat> this is because if there is organic components in the sedimentary rocks, they can have very low values. They are reduced sometimes in sulfur. And this is the argument that these workers put forward for the low values. So here's now the gas data for the carbon isotopes. We can test whether there's also any sediment influence or not. Again, the mantle values are the green bar. And um, here we can look at um, the crustal additions. Crustal additions are to the right of the green bar. And uh, what we find is Papandayan values, they fall again into the green bar, into the mainly magmatic range. And uh, the Kavai Gen values, they differ. They're going off to the right. So that would indicate we also have a crustal addition of carbon of CO2 here that we can record. And uh, during the PhD of Lara Blythe, we looked at a large data collection of carbon isotopes from CO2 gases. And she came up with an average value for most of the known um, Javanese gas values of minus 4.3 as being a good magmatic value. And this we call the JAC, the Java ARC um, uh, average carbonate value. And this is um, approximately where this pink line would fall. And this coincides with the Papandayan data, but it does not coincide with the Kava Igen data. So, and um, marine limestone is at higher values at about zero to potentially even plus two. So here we get a good indication that the CO2 in the gas at Kava Igen is influenced by sedimentary rocks in the basement as well. So here, a very boring text slide, I'm afraid. Um, this is my summary. And here, when we employ these values, like the uh, mantle values that we know, and the average gas values for arcs, then we will see that Papandayan is not untypical for arcs and mantle. Kavaijen, however, is elevated in carbon isotopes. And this is most probably a result of external volatile additions. So since mantle derived volatile sources appear relatively similar along the Java segment of the arc, Kava Ijen requires some local and very specific additions to explain the very low delta um, sulfur and high delta carbon components that we're seeing in the isotope values. So mixing of gas species, meaning magmatic plus crustal volatiles is the best explanation I have here. So, and we might need to add some organic sulfur. This can be from sediments, but also marine carbonates. And this is again from sediments. So both indications we get is that the sedimentary basement, which is several kilometers thick, is likely playing quite a substantial role at Kava Ijen. And this may also be a reason why we have this prolific sulfur production site because we're actually getting extra gas, not just volcanic gas, magmatic gas, but extra gas. We might be liberating gas from the basement here as well. So this is a summary of the two um, uh, components. And uh, this is just the individual bar charts, but put against each other. And marine carbonate is this little area on the left in blue. Uh, this is kind of um, the marine carbonates from Java that we analyzed, and they are falling into that area in uh, the blue bar there. The Kavai Gen data falling between mantle and this blue bar, and most of the Sunda arc data, including Papandayan, they fall into that pink bar. So um, here, I think we're getting a good indication that Kavai Gen is different because it actually gets a lot of extra gas. And this is a wider study that is also still 
in the process of being written up. This is a study from many volcanoes where we took gas. This is from the PhD thesis of Lara Blythe. And here we looked at Krakatau, Salak, Gede, uh, and many more volcanoes, Marah Peak, and of course, Kavaijen, and also Batur on Bali. And uh, Anna Krakatau is the most mantle-like because it has the thinnest crust. And all the other volcanoes on Java and Bali seem to have a little bit of crustal influence. This is using carbon isotopes, the carbon concentration, and helium isotopes. And uh, what we see is that morp is the mantle, limestone, and sediment can come from either the subducted slab or the crust. And we see that Kava Ejen actually falls very close to the limestone line. So we must be accepting now that we are adding local crustal material here because the subduction zone would be most likely down there at Krakatau, but it is not. So we also must see that there's unsystematic behavior. There's not just one single trend that goes with a subduction zone or with the crustal thickness. There is unsystematic spread of this data. So it implies each system behaves a little bit different. Each system has its unique way of recycling crustal carbonates or crustal sediments in their particular plumbing system. So um, <clears throat> let me summarize this now. If you do calculations with this, if you do a mass balance with the sulfur, then about 20 to 25% of the sulfur would actually come from the crust when I use the isotope data. And for the carbon, it's actually even worse because uh, if we do that for the carbon isotopes, then most of the carbon, most of the CO2 at Kavai Gen seems to be actually from limestone. If our data are good, the maximum data would actually give more than 80% of the CO2 being derived, at times at least, from the local crust. So the local crust is a major factor according to the gas chemistry. And uh, here, this will play a significant role also in eruptive behavior. And it will have implications for geothermal energy harvesting. And um, this is work by Francis Deegan. And uh, this goes back uh, some 10 years now, but it's a really well cited paper. And uh, it really made a difference to our understanding. Here we have used carbonate, Javanese carbonate, and Javanese basalt. And this was from Merapi in uh, central Java. And we heated this up to 1200 degrees Celsius. And we given a little bit of pressure. And we allowed this to react. The reaction is super fast. Here we are breaking down the carbonate. And we are developing a lot of gas. And here's two experimental products, one at zero second seconds, meaning we just heated the experiment up. The heating up time was six minutes. And then a 60 second, that means heating up time, six minutes plus one minute of interaction time. And you see a lot of gas bubbles. And the carbonate is almost completely dissolved. So if magma and carbonate come together, it makes for a very explosive mixture. And it produces a lot of gas, mainly CO2. but there's also sulfur in there because often limestone has sulfur and evaporites that are often mixed with limestone have, of course, sulfur as well. So in a subsequent study, Blythe et al. 2015, we looked at this in a little bit more detail. And what we found was that um, once these gas bubbles form, they accumulate locally in the magma once we assimilate this material. But after a while, they blow out, they make these gas blowouts. And this was, of course, only an experiment on a very small scale. But in theory, this can be also used for larger systems. And there's a sketch in color in the top right where we imagine how this would happen if bits of limestone break and fall into magma. You would get these bursts of CO2 that would come out. And maybe this is something that's happening at depth under Kava Ejen at certain times. And uh, this, of course, is important because if we want to think about geothermal power there, I think we have a problem. A geothermal power plant effectively uses uh, gas that's produced at depth, often water that's pumped in. 
and uh, this is then converted to steam and it increases in volume. But what you want to have for that is a very steady flow of gas. And you don't want to have blowouts. You don't want to have gas explosions. So here is an image from um, New Zealand. That's the Wairaki um, power plant. And uh, there is a lot of particular material, uh, a lot of dissolved material in the gas. And this is why the pipes often clock up. And if you have thin narrowing pipes and gas outbursts, it's not a good combination. So personally, I'm very concerned about this. Now, Indonesia is using a lot of geothermal power these days. It's the largest, the third largest geothermal energy producer in the world. There is active exploration on Sumatra, of course, also on Java, on Sulawesi and on Bali. And um, I have visited uh, some of the geothermal power plants in West Java and on Sumatra a few years ago. And uh, most of them are located in West Java. I think this is largely because the population density is highest there. And this also means a lot of uh, the energy is required there. So this is from Salak geothermal power plant in West Java. And there we sampled gas as well. And what we found is that the gas there also has a crustal component. It's not pure magmatic gas. So I'm starting to wonder whether the mixture between magmatic and crustal volatiles is what is very good for the production of gas. But of course, it also comes with this problem of irregularity. So you might have gas outbursts as we've seen in the lake at Kava Ijen. So here's just a few more impressions from Salak. And um, my final words now for the last few slides is about power plants and about climate. So here we have extra volatiles that I believe are added to the mantle derived volcanic volatiles. And that makes for particularly high gas production. This is attractive if you want to build a geothermal power plant, but it also means you have to be careful because they are at higher risk because you may not find that the crustal gas is coming in a steady way. It may produce certain outbursts at certain times as some of these experiments that we did imply. So here, extra gas, extra CO2, extra SO2, extra H2O, and potentially also methane CH4 could be very attractive, but also dangerous in a way. And of course, CO2 and SO2 are climate active volatiles. So some people ask me at times, oh, what about the volcanoes? Could they be uh, responsible for global warming? And of course, um, they are contributing, but I think we must not forget that volcanoes were active for a long time in Earth history, so they cannot be the most important kind of uh, contributor. I think uh, also the man-made uh, CO2 emissions and SO2 emissions from coal burning, from fossil fuel burnings are a lot larger than what volcanoes contribute. So here we must realize that uh, volcanoes produce only a small percentage of anthropogenic um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. But I would like to add one thought here, and this is not my thought, it goes back to Paul Younger, who uh, was a professor for geothermal energy. And he said, if we manage to capture all the sulfur and all the CO2 that is emitted from all the power plants, we could actually reduce um, the CO2 emissions considerably. And this will actually be a good measure against global warming because we are piping the gas already through these geothermal power plants. So each time we're building a new power plant, we might want to develop technology to also capture the remaining CO2. This has not been done yet. It's technically challenging, but this is a thought that I would like to offer. And this is uh, Paul Younger's legacy. He passed away a few years ago. So hopefully uh, some of the companies that develop power plants will think about that and therefore reduce the natural CO2 emissions and therefore also reduce the um, uh, climate problems that we are facing in the future to a certain percentage. So I'd like to say thank you for uh, your time and interest and uh, yeah, this is uh, at uh, one of my early visits where I didn't have a gas mask, so I had to help myself 
in a very traditional style with a bandana. But uh, yeah, thank you very much uh, for your times. And of course, if you have questions, I would be more than happy to kind of answer what I can. But as I said, I'm not a specialist for the local geology, but uh, maybe some of the other aspects are of interest.